This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 16. Now, before we get started, as you know, we make sure that we've confessed our known sins and they're allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege, the opportunity, the time, everything you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. In our last lesson, we were looking at how a wise person responds to people's behavior in conflict and their speech. Let's continue in that section. We had went over beginning in verse 13. So let's just read that in the following couple of verses to catch us up. Proverbs 18, 13. He who gives an answer before he listens, it is to him folly and shame. 14. A man's spirit will endure sickness, but who can bear a crushed spirit? 15. The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Now these may seem rather random, but understand in the positive ones, they are the wise person. Okay? Um, the one in this, this little sequence here would be the one in verse 15. Uh, 14 would be basically a general principle. All right? 13 would give a fool. So we go from a fool to a general principle. And then verse 15. When I mean a general principle, it's just a general application. Um, now, all of them are general truths. By that I mean this is usually the case. Not 100% of the time. Now, there are some Proverbs that are like that, but usually Proverbs are just general truth. They tell you this is the way it is in the world, uh, this is the way it usually is in the world, most of the time it's this way, all right? Uh, 15 would be one of those that would be always true. The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge, you see. Well... I try to point that out as we go along, but I think most of it can be figured out by you by now if you've thought along how the Proverbs work. Verse 16. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. Now, you may be suspicious about this one because you probably thought you might know what this means, but then you're probably asking, does it really? <laughs> I would say probably, yeah, if you're like me. Let's begin it. A man's gift makes room for him. Basically, the word for gift, uh, matan. Now, the reason I point out the word sometimes is to show you some of the different definitions. You'll have these different uses, depending on the translations, but they also have different uh, definitions according to how they're being used. Now, this one is probably a bribe, or close to a bribe. Now, what I mean by that here, what happens is a man has a gift, He's, he comes into a situation where he wants access to something. All right? He wants to talk to the boss, or he wants to talk to the, the owner, or he wants a favor from the owner, and so he brings a gift. That's what it means. It makes room for him. Then the next line adds to the idea of access and brings him. The word means brings him, means ushers him ushers him in before the great. Now, who are the great? That would be the boss, uh, the, the king, the powerful, the more flu influential people. <clears throat> so what this is teaching is that a gift opens the door to more opportunities and people. Often it is a bribe, but not always. It can be used that way. This is another general truth principle. 
You bring somebody a gift that you don't know and you want to talk to their supervisor, you can get your way in there a lot easier rather than just saying, I'd like to see your boss, you see. <clears throat> now, when combined with the next pro uh, few proverbs, we can see where it would be used as a bribe. Now, let's talk about that for a moment. <clears throat> in the ancient courts, and even some courts today, the poor are often at a disadvantage. They can't afford their own lawyer. Uh, others who have money have advantages. That's really not quite the situation here. However, in the ancient world, <clears throat> it was not unusual to bring those in the court, the officials, the judge, the magistrates, whoever was there, some sort of gift. That put the poor at a disadvantage. A gift influences people. People closely associated to the king or the king himself who has to make a judgment between someone who can bring a gift and a poor per person who cannot. You can see the situation. So a gift influences people. Public trust should be impervious to these type of things. Gifts like this pervert justice. It violates the moral order of righteousness and justice and equity. So in this case, the gift is being used more as a bribe. Now, verse 17 gives us something like a courtroom setting. The first to state his case seems right until his opponent comes and cross-examines him. Now, this first person to state his case gives his view, sounds reasonable, sounds good. The opposite view has not come up yet. But what if this first person has also brought a gift? The second person has it. Well, you can see where this guy uh, uh, who came first, who has the gift, is sitting good, looking innocent, especially from a bribed official. Then the opponent comes in. The word here he cross-examines. Kakar. A searching examination. Now, we've already learned that also in the ancient world, the one who brings a big bribe the guilty one may not even get to present his case or do a cross-examination, but in this case he does. So this is telling you basically if it's going to be fair, normally the first person who presents his case, if it makes perfectly good sense, it seems that he's right until his opponent comes in and begins to ask questions. He does a uh, cross-examination as they call it in court today. And that includes being analytical and probing, asking those key questions. So we some, see something here about justice. There must be an opportunity for the person at a disadvantage to cross-examine his opponent. Let's make some application. <clears throat> You're in a position where you have to make a judgment. Maybe you're a parent over children. A teacher questioning students about some offense, some incident. Elders in a church looking to a dispute between some of the people in the church. Or maybe you're trying to settle a difference between some friends. In this case, it was a judge and jury in a legal courtroom. Before fair judgment, both sides of the story have to be presented. Evidence has to be presented and witnesses. Now, there's a line I've used for years. I still, it still holds true. There's always another story. or there's, not, there's always another side to the story. Listen to the other side. Too many times you don't get to present your side. That's happened to me a few times. And I can tell you almost every time it's a railroad in other words, it's a very unfair judgment if they never want to hear the other case, the other side of the case, what really happened, or why I did what I did if I was the one who was being um, accused. 
So this is true of anyone having to make a judgment. See both sides of the story. I've been in situations where they already make a decision before they even hear the other side. Oh, we don't need to hear him. Wait a minute. That's not really what happened. But you see, they weren't interested in really what happened. They just had an opportunity to get rid of someone they didn't like, and they did it, no matter how unfairly. And had, even though they had a false grounds to do it, in their mind, well, he didn't deserve a fair trial. You see. Now, folks, that's often the way the world is. And I think you know that. You do what's right. You want justice. You want the truth to come out. If given the opportunity, you want to give your side, or as a witness, call witnesses forward, you want to make a fair evaluation. Now, believers, after they've grown a while, that becomes part of their makeup. They want to see justice and equity. You, you hate injustice. You really don't like to see people wronged. And often in the ancient world, it was the poor people who were wronged. That's one reason they stayed poor. They could ne never get, and I mean this literally, a fair break. A fair break. You would have a rich landowner who decide, decided not to pay the workers in the field what he agreed to give them. They take, take him to court. But the landowner has already made his bribe. He's already given his side of the story. And the poor field workers don't even get an, op get an opportunity to speak. The only opportunity now is if you want to keep working or do you want to quit? Verse 18. Here's one of those that usually raises eyebrows. The lot puts an end to quarrels and decides between powerful contenders. Now this lot, again, and we've seen this before in our studies, is the casting of lots. Now this bothers people because they don't really understand how things worked in the Old Testament. Casting lots were often a way to make decisions. And we've studied that in the past. I don't know how long ago it was in the Proverbs series. But let's talk about it for a moment. The lot is the casting lot. Uh, it's similar to tossing a coin. You had some rocks marked, sticks marked. You tossed them, and whichever way it came up is the decision to be made. Now, we did see this back in 1633. Let me just bring that up for a moment. <clears throat> The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So here, cast in the lap means it was private. As I recall, we did study this recently. So we understand what the lot is. In the ancient world, the lot was used to reveal God's choice. Under the Mosaic Covenant, now listen carefully. Under the Mosaic Covenant, when a decision could not be made, or God's will was unknown uh, in, uh, in important matters. The lot was cast. Joshua 7, 14 through 18. 1 Samuel 14, 40 through 42. We even have that done with Jonah 1, 7, though I don't think those people were operating under the old covenant at that time. But it was still a common practice. But understand, believers used it. So now we have a situation <clears throat> in this particular proverb where there is a uh, legal dispute where an impartial decision needed to be made and yet the facts, the evidence, and maybe even the witnesses could not sway the judge one way or the other. But the understanding was that God knew everything. God saw everything. Nothing got past him. He would be totally fair. So they cast lots. And as the verse, first line says, the lot puts an end to quarrels and decides between powerful. Now, the word for powerful is interesting because it could mean physically powerful or it could be one who just had a strong argument. We use the word, I use the word contender here. They're sort of competing for their view. 
So, what or who are the contenders? Well, they could be the lawyers, the courtroom officials, or it could be the two in dispute. But here we have where they toss a lot to make the decision and decides between powerful contenders. And one of the principles this is basically teaching is let God decide. Let God decide. When the arguments and evidence are equal, lots were cast, calling the decision, and that ended the case. Now, if the opponent thought he got the short end of the stick anyway, he should submit to the verdict, be humble before God, trust him in his greater plan. There's a lesson there. The winner should not gloat. It may have been, well, let me put it this way. It may not have been worth bringing the issue to court. How much damage did it do? Yes, you won. You were right. How much damage did it cause to relationships, to your business, your reputation, that type of thing? That's one reason people don't bring cases to court today, because it ruined their reputation. Even though hey, they had a good case and they were right. They just won't, don't want the publicity. Verse 19 A brother offended is more unyielding than a fortified city, and disputes are like the barred gates of a fortified citadel. I really like these expressions because they're, to me they bring to, to the mind a picture of what you're having to deal with. Now we can picture a fortified city, uh, an ancient city that had high walls and uh, you know it had the defensive positions up on the high walls where they could throw down uh, hot oil or, or rocks or shoot arrows, that type of thing, sling rocks. A brother offended is more unyielding than a fortified city. Now, this is a brother, someone close, a relative. Sometimes it's used for a countryman. He's more unyielding than a fortified city. The second line, similar to the first, and meaning and disputes are like the barred gates of a fortified citadel. Now, what are the barred gates? Well, you've seen castles. And you might see uh, one with a moat. You know, when they raise the little bridge up in front of the castle and you can't get through it because of the moat. Well, this is similar. So what you have here is when you get a dispute between two related people, they can set up their defensive walls. That's what this amounts to. And you can't get through to them. The walls that go up between the two are like the barred heavy gates in a fortification. Very little possibility of getting through. Now that's someone who is close to you. Why is it that way? Well, let me elaborate. So what we have here is a brother, a relative, or a countryman who's been offended and is very difficult to break through to. In other words, you cannot get the matter settled. You cannot get him to listen. You can't get him to do anything. Why? Because this person had trusted you. And trust has been lost, replaced by distrust and bitterness. And these two people may never talk again, at least in a friendly way. You see, when you trust someone and you wrong them, and they, or they wrong you, or both, and suddenly that trust is gone, I can't trust you anymore. You can't get through them anymore. They don't ever trust what you say again. That's the idea. Now, if it's linked to the previous proverb regarding the court case, 
He's unyielding. He's close to any discussion of the matter. He don't want to talk about it anymore. He lost his case. He don't trust you. He'll even say he didn't know you were that kind. And your relationship is over with. So here's a point of application. Be careful about making a case out of something, whether it's legitimate or not. When it's close, <clears throat> a person who's close to you is involved, if he's offended you. You have to ask yourself, are you ready to lose this person as a friend, as an associate, maybe a business partner, maybe someone who was a relative? If you live long enough, you may have experienced this already. Reconciliation with people close to you is often the most difficult. They are not who you thought they were. They thought, well, I thought you were an honest person. Well, I thought you were an honest person. So here you go, you see. Sometimes, even if you were 100% right, if you want that relationship to get back to where it was, you may have to just bite the bullet, as they say. <clears throat> not admit you're wrong but just drop the matter. In the ancient world, if there was an impartial judge, um, we saw that they could use the lot if he couldn't decide. The point is that should end it. Now in this case, if it's brothers, and there's a case between them, between them already there's a problem. Both were probably hurt. Both lost something. And you have to weigh the decision. Is it more important to win this case or be reconciled to my brother? That's life. That's decisions we have to make in life. You say, oh, I wish life was easier. Well, it's not. Now today, Christians should be able to handle most all their disputes between each other. And do it fairly. Now, things do happen that cause misunderstandings, miscalculations. Maybe you didn't really hear what you thought you heard. Or maybe they were talking about somebody else and you thought they were talking about you. Sometimes it's just best to let it pass. Not react to something you thought you might have heard. Maybe there was a wrong judgment about you. They didn't know the situation or why you did what you did. Maybe it was an unfair situation. Or someone was taking advantage. There's all sorts of various circumstances here. You don't want to jump out there right quick and say, Hey, I know what you did. And you really don't. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Until you learn the facts. And if it's a critical matter... You have to ask questions? Yes, you have to ask questions. Where'd that money go? Or who did you hire? That type of thing. But ask yourself, is it worth breaking off the relationship over this dispute? In verse 20, we have the power of speech. The power of speech. Speech has a lot of power. What you say usually followed by uh, what you do. Verse 20. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied, and the product of his lips, he is satisfied. You know, when you think about these proverbs were written down uh, about 3,000 years ago, it's amazing how much they still hold today. But that's the way truth is. Uh, human nature hasn't changed. The world is pretty much what it was. And people do the same things. Well, let's look at these two lines together. <clears throat> Note first, we see the principle of production in these lines. We see fruit in the first one, then we see product in the second one. 
From the mouth and lips, again, refers to speech. So it's the fruit and product of speech or speech. Now you ask, where does the stomach come in? It says his stomach is satisfied. The stomach, let me just get a little technical here, is the word betin. It means stomach or belly. Here is figurative for the inner person, the inner man, who you are. Uh, soul is often the understanding people have a common, uh, even though the word isn't completely understood accurately according to what it is in this in the actual text um, it's a misunderstood word that is often a common word for the inner man so I have a choice of either just going with it or try to change the word every time I see it but that's the idea it's the inner you um, the idea is that it, it well much like the heart it's a lot like the heart in this case, with emphasis on the emotions. Okay? The stomach is in parallel with the man himself. If you look, look at this, the top line, the stomach satisfied, the bottom line, he is satisfied. So what this is saying is, people feed on their own words. Whatever they say, whether good or bad, Again, people feed on their own words, whatever they say, whether good or bad. What you dish out, you end up taking back in. And the picture of the satisfaction is that it's taken in fully. You completely understand what you said. It's like it cycles back to you. So we see how words have affected people. A number of verses, 131, 8, 19, 11, 30, 12, 14. Here the point is made that it fully affects the speaker. It has an effect on what, whatever you say. You, you, you know, sometimes you'll say something, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. So then you realize you had a reaction to it. It really wasn't what you wanted. You didn't like feeling the way you do. Now this should be taken as general principle. Remember this, what you say has an effect upon you as well. You say something mean, and you hear it come from your lips, you say, you know, that was kind of mean. Yes. So see, that's the idea behind this principle. Now, what we have here is another case where a general principle is stated, followed by some proverbs that kind of elaborate on that principle. Eighteen twenty one. Here we go. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Hmm. Well, the word for power here is the hand, literally hand. It represents power, so we just leave it translated power. And those who uh, love it will eat its fruit. So this is what this is saying. The words you hear, the words you take in, all right, it affects your life. In this case, it could be a life or death matter. To lead you closer to a better life or towards death. I like this proverb. It's an old Jewish proverb. It was found in the uh, Mish Midrash. That's an ancient Jewish commentary. Listen to this. It talks about slander. It also tells you something about death and life. How effective the tongue is. Listen to the evil tongue. Here it is. Here's this proverb. The evil tongue slays three. The slanderer, the slandered, and the listener. The evil tongue slays three. The slanderer, one who's saying it. The slandered, the one who's slandered. And the listener, the people who listen to it. Now let's look back at our verse and let's see the analogy here. 
Who or what you listen to, you consume. Now, what I mean by that is you're listening to them all the time. Maybe you like talk radio. Maybe you like a particular writer. Maybe you have a commentator you listen to on the television or somewhere else. Or a particular friend. And you're always listening to what they say and always doing what they're saying. It affects you. It helps shape you. It shapes your thinking and emotions. Even your value system. That tongue you listen to gets you excited. That person who speaks like that gets you excited. So you get excited when they get excited. Or when they're down, you're down. You see? That's the power of the tongue. And people who like to hear this tongue all the time, who love it, will eat its fruit. That's what it produces. Remember the person who likes to always hear himself? Well, <laughs> if he just likes to hear, hear himself, well, he'll be full of himself. Tough people to be around. So the pattern of this verse, let, let's make it personal. Let me put it this way. Let's just make this personal. We are affected by what we hear and what we say. The previous verse is what we say. It comes back on us. Now it says we're affected by whoever's tongue we listen to. It affects others. It can be good or bad. It can lead to good or bad or life or death. Those around us, the community, are affected by it. The, power has, the tongue has power to influence, to move, to change people in a positive or negative way. Now, we've seen that if the tongue is positive, it's refreshing. It benefits the community. It adds life and vitality. But if it's negative, ranging all the way to wicked, it can hurt a community, start quarrels, divide even close relationships and communities. So now that we understand something about this, let's look at it again. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You love to hear talk, it'll eat its fruit. And it will decide the direction of your life. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be around negative people. Oh, it's going to be a bad day. They're often whiners. Things never go right for me. All my hips hurting again, you know, the next next week. Oh, my back is hurting now. You know, it just goes on and on. Well, why don't you go to the doctor? Oh, it wouldn't help. You take your medicine? It doesn't help. So there you're stuck with them. I'll take some distance there. Well, it just gets better. Let's look at this next category. Wealth and wisdom in the court and in the home. Well, that's just the start of a big subject, I should say, lengthwise. You can see it's a bunch of verses, finishing up this chapter and then well into the next one. Many people like this one, verse 22. It's well known. It's going to require a little depth, though. He who finds a wife finds good and obtains favor from the Lord. You'll often see this translated, finds a good thing. Well, I don't, really don't like the word thing. Uh, I don't know if that's a really something a woman would think about. She's being called a thing for a moment, but I think she understands. But I'll just leave good, because thing is really just an insert to help maybe make better sense. But really, is it, you find good. Let's break this down, because this is actually quite good. Notice, he who finds, well, first of all, that's the implication that he's looking. For those of you who are single, heads up. Trusting the Lord while doing it. Are you looking, single person? Trusting the Lord while you're doing it. Here the man finds, he finds a wife. He's been trusting the Lord. If he's been trusting the Lord and he finds a wife, that's a good thing. 
Let's look at the word good a minute. You'll get a kick out of this. It's a word we've seen often, tov. It can mean pleasant, good, beneficial. Now, it is in masculine form. Now, all that means is that if you want to, you can make it a person. Now, since it's a masculine, you have a tendency to make it a man. It can't be a man. So you just leave the word good or put thing instead. Good thing or just good. But the point is made. Let me get the verse back up there. He who finds a wife finds good. Now, I just gave you some of the definitions of good. Pleasant, beneficial. Note that perfect is not one of those definitions. It does not mean always pleasant or beneficial or even always good. But on balance, general truth, remember, the wife is good. So, when the man finds the one wife he's been trusting the Lord to find, she's a good find. The Lord is the source of the good wife. He has trusted in finding her and does. And when he does, look at the second line, and obtains favor from the Lord. Now, let's look at the word favor for a moment. Ratson. Or actually, ratson here. Ratson. It means favor as translator. What is pleasing from the Lord? Something that God wanted to please you with. God has shown favor on you when you find a good wife. It's a favor from the Lord to find a good wife. He has provided The wife is a pleasing, delightful gift from the Lord. And the idea that when she is found, it implies God's providence involved. God's providence is involved in you finding her. She's a gift from the Lord. And notice, a man finds her. Now, that doesn't mean, ladies, that, and we know you do these things, that you don't have to put yourself in a position to be found. Some do. Nothing wrong with that. You spotted him first. Suddenly, you're walking right across his path. He, get a good, he gets a good look at you. You've already looked him over. It's been said that women often choose their men. Well, it really goes both ways. But both can be involved in the setup. When God made the woman for man, Scripture says it was good. Compare Genesis 2.18 with one thirty. That was God's design for the human race, for there to be women with the men. About this time, some of you are probably thinking, but there are other proverbs that say to a wife is not so good. Well, what about all that stuff Paul wrote over in 1 Corinthians? All right, well, let's look at the wider context for a few moments. I'm going to teach this in detail. This could be taught for days probably, but... But let's just look at the wider context, because we want some accuracy here and understanding. Some wives can bring misery. She may have been good at one point, but now she's bringing misery. She's changed. That's right, people change. But she's not being good anymore. Well, that's the way life is. Why take the risk? Maybe it's not worth it. You're right. But see, you don't know. Some of those situations where if you really put the whole situation in the Lord's hand, you've got to trust the Lord to work through it. There will be challenges, just like having kids. There are challenges. But you work through it like you do anything else in life. It's difficult. And that's part of being an adult. Remember this one? 
Well, actually, we've had similar ones, but we haven't got to this one technically, though I think I've mentioned in other teachings. Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Yeah, that doesn't shine a good picture on marriage, does it? And someone says, but Paul, he said he wished people stayed unmarried. Did not Paul say he wished people would stay unmarried? Well, let's look at that for a few minutes. I'm just going to go to the NIV on this. <clears throat> we may teach Corinthians soon. 1 Corinthians 7, 7. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now, first of all, I want those of you who are married or those who want to get married or about to get married to relax because it's okay to get married. We have to look at this verse in context because in this broader context of 1 Corinthians, there are a number of things going on. So there are a few things that Paul mentions that qualify this statement about remaining single. I'm not going to teach this in detail, but I think you'll get the point. But we have to look at some context. First of all, let's talk, this word, talk about this word gift. And look at the way it's put. And one has this gift, another has that. And it's like, well, and this one over there has that one. The gift here is not celibacy. Any more than the other gift is marriage. There's not a gift of marriage. You say, but, but, but I've been taught. Wait a minute. There's a gift of celibacy? I don't know where that's ever taught in Scripture. When it came to Paul, he wasn't talking about his gift of celibacy. There was no gift of celibacy. He is talking about his gift that God had given him. His position, you might say, in life. Now, it might involve his spiritual gifts, his mission, his purpose, all that package. And if you followed me with Paul through Acts, for example, he had a rough life, a rough life. He had his moments of joy and great happiness, of course, but his life was pretty rough. And he sums it up in Corinthians where he talks about all the various difficult tortures and being in jail, threatened, and so on and so on. That was his mission in life. Now, can you imagine a wife trying to go along with him? It would not have worked. And Paul uses the word, I wish. I wish you all could stay like me and dedicate yourselves like I am. But there's no one like the Apostle Paul. I don't think there ever will be again. And generally the advice is, you do what God wants you to do with the gift God gives you. That's what this is saying. If you have a gift that calls on very difficult mission work, some of the great missionaries stayed single, women included, then stay single. And that's one of the principles that Paul brings out here. Gift here has to do with how God has gifted one for service. Marriage was not for Paul. His mission and purpose in life which was unique, would have been very difficult, if not impossible, for any woman to go along. Paul lived also in a very difficult time. Uh, as the transition, transition was making, uh, a transition from, well, let me put it this way. You know, there's several things going on at once during Paul's life. Not only is the gospel being spread amongst the Jews as they move from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, salvation now comes through understanding who Christ was and trusting in Him. The Jews were offended by that. The Jews would get upset. They'd get the authorities on their side, and pretty soon you had both the Jewish authorities and the local authorities coming after you because of the problems you were causing. And you were just telling them about Jesus. So many Christians, especially Paul, 
were under fire from the authorities. That comes out in verse 26 of our chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 7. Not a good situation for Christians, let alone a married couple. Remember Aquila and Priscilla, if you know the story, they had to flee Rome. But admittedly, there are less troubles in life. 728. But again, it goes back to the opening principle here. It has to do with your gift. He goes on to say that time is short. He defines this in verse 31. For this world in its present form is passing away. Now this is another way of saying that Paul's anticipating the return of Christ. One of these days it's all going to be gone. Paul lived in anticipation of the return of the Lord. He knew it was the last days. Of course, that's been some 2,000 years ago. He speaks about believers staying free from concern. So you have to, when it comes to marriage, have to decide. What, am I, what do I want to do for the Lord? What do I want to do for the Lord? Do I need long-term preparation? Am I going to go into a difficult situation? What about the day and time in which I live? What is your gifts, your set of spiritual gifts, or maybe you just have one? Your situation, your purpose, your mission in life. Sometimes it is best to stay single. You may not even be wanting a wife or wanting a husband. Fine. Stay that way. Well, what if I want to change my mind later on? Change your mind. Stay with the Lord on this. Depend on the Lord. Lord, I don't know if I want to get married or not. So if you think I should, would you bring me a wife? No, don't. It doesn't work that way. You do what you know the Lord wants you to do. Don't leave it up to guesswork. You set yourself on mission, and you say, boy, you know, I, I really think it would be best for me to have a wife right now. And if that lingers in your mind, then start thinking about it, start praying about it, put it in the Lord's hands, and see who he brings along, one way or the other, whether you're male or female. For others, it's best to be married. Paul says, stay single. Now, let, me, let me say that again. Paul never commands to stay single. He does say it's what's best for him. For him it was. But it depended on one's gift. That's how he qualifies it. And that's what you got to remember in that verse. Depends on your gift. Depends on your gift. Now those who are married tend to say, well, you know, it would be best to get married if you're going to be in ministry. And I've had it both ways, basically. You may not know this, but I was 40 Plus, when I got married, I stayed a long time single in ministry. It was tough. It was tough. There's a lot of attractive women in, in these colleges as well as in the seminaries. Uh, I went out to a seminary where they had a uh, college connected to it. Plenty of young, available women. I look back and say, why was I interested in the women? <laughs> That doesn't seem normal, but you see, I was so focused on getting my preparation for those years, um, I didn't hardly date at all. Here's what the point is. One should remain in whatever state he can best serve God. If one wants to change his or her state, that is something between that person and God. But this entire passage has to do uh, with Paul's particular situation, his, his direction and his circumstances, and some general advice on marriage throughout pretty much much of this chapter. But like other passages, it has to be mixed with all the other marriage passages besides the ones we're studying. So take it in the context of all of Scripture. Take it in the context of Proverbs, what we've been saying. 
Verse 22 again. 1822 of Proverbs. He who finds a wife finds good and obtains favor from the Lord. Notice, obtains favor from the Lord. And that still holds true. You find a good wife in ministry, you found a good thing, period. Or ladies, you think you would like to serve a husband who's in ministry, you found a good thing. Kind of reversed there, but let's put it this way. God has brought you to someone and let that person find you. You can put it that way if you want. You get the point. Let's move to the next section. Trouble with wealth and companions. Verse 23. The poor use entreaties, but the rich answer, answer harshly. That's sort of one of those general principles again. The poor use entreaties. Entreaty is kind of a word. We don't use it too much, but the idea is that you're pleading for mercy or you're, you're pleading. The poor plead or ask, maybe even beg. The poor person asks for help. He wants someone to show him favor because he's having trouble making it. Yes, now we're talking about the ancient world. We're not talking about a state where there's a security net or welfare system. You still may have people standing on the corner asking for money. But we're talking about the poor. These are really people who are poor. They ask for help, but the rich answer harshly. They're just telling, telling us how when these two come in contact, what often happens. The word for harshly here means fierce or roughly. No, I don't want anything to do with you. The idea is the rich have no intention of giving up anything for a poor person. It may be because of their own personal insecurities or selfishness that they would deny someone who is really in need. This tells us how far apart these two are. One is in need and begging. The other has an abundance and brushes him off as if a nuisance. Notice there's no government law that steps in and says, oh, that rich person's got to give that poor person some money. No. No, that's not the way it works. You want people to do these things by their free will, by their choice. You don't want to force them. That just builds resentment. And it makes the poor person dependent upon the government. Let both trust in God. Give them that freedom. This is one reason the anti-God governments often want great control over people. That's what the Antichrist does. They want great control over people. The health care you have, the food you get, it has to come from the government. The job you get has to come from the government. The pay you get, the amount you get has to come from the government. You see, you lose your freedom. You want your freedom to operate before God without interference, without having to work around the government. I'm a person who likes to avoid the government as much as I can because it just usually means trouble. Not being unlawful, not saying that. But the rules and regulations are just ridiculous. And the more you get into them, you wonder, well, this contradicts this. And they won't admit it, but they know they do. The agencies overlap and contradict each other in their rules and regulations. So you can be following the rules of one, one agency, and then you've got the difference between state and federal agencies. They have different standards by which they usher out benefits. Uh, for example, Texas does not require homeschoolers to register with the state. But the federal government says you have to register if you're going to get government benefits. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's right. They force you to homeschool registered with some outfit or go to public school. Well, that's just an example. Now, we have this rich person answering this poor person harshly. A number of reasons that could happen, but it's typical. 
Often the least charitable people are the richest. Why? Because it's their security. Remember, it's their fortified city. And he's defending his city. Maybe their depression era. Now, there's not many of those people around anymore. But, oh, when you got someone who went through the depression and they're on your church board, I'm talking maybe 20 years ago, they don't want to release any money to, for anything. I, oh, the complaints I used to get. Uh, I had one church that just wanted to keep me basically poor. Poor. And they had the money to let me not live poor. And I was their pastor. And I just didn't understand why they... And then I found out that at the board meeting, they had a bunch of money in the bank. I said, well, why don't they share that with... And one guy said that, you know, he can't afford to go out and eat. That's what one guy said. <laughs> well, I was there to serve. Well, come to find out, some of these people have been in the Depression. So we were talking about years ago. And one guy told me, I'll never forget, he says, you know, I built my house. Okay, well, am I supposed to build my house now? I think he said I built it for $5,000. Well, that was probably 30 years ago before this happened. So now we're talking almost 50 years ago. Actually longer than that when this incident happened. More like, well, close to 50, I guess. Well, I'll take it back. The incident with me happened about 30 years ago. Then that guy hadn't built his house was probably close to 50 years ago, maybe longer. At any rate, the point is people got pretty stingy who came out of the Depression. I understand that tendency to hoard stuff because they went so long without anything. Well, let's close this out with the last one. We'll just stop with 24 here. A man who has unreliable companions is about to be broken. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, let me just define companion right here, because it's true in both passages, the, the unreliable companion and the friend. Both people, the companion and the friend, live with this man. Now, they may live at the same time together or separately together, but it's just giving you two examples. Um, a man who has an unreliable companion that he's living with. He's about to be broken. That is the man who lives with the unreliable companion. Second line, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So the second person has a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Here's the comparison. The word for broken means to uh, bring to ruin. All right, that's, the, that's what the first principle says. It brings to ruin. So this is a contrast between... Now listen to this, a wise person who has an unreliable companion as a roommate, let's just keep it simple, and another wise person who has another roommate who's a friend. So one has an unreliable companion as a roommate, the other one has a friend as a roommate. The first line tells us, if you get in trouble, and your only companion is an unreliable one, that trouble's going to happen because he's not going to step in and help you. You'll be broken. That's what it means. You're about to be broken. If you're about to go to a very difficult time that will ruin you, one type of companion will lend no support at all. That's the unreliable one, and you go right into ruin. But the other one, he wouldn't let that happen because he's a friend. So you don't go into ruin. So what's the principle? You want a companion you can trust. The first companion is one of those fair-weathered friends. You know, he's always around during good times. When things start going bad, he's gone. Something happens, you need some support, maybe you need 50 bucks, he's gone. The second companion companion, however, is right there with you through thick and thin. It may be financial. Maybe you got physical problems. Going to court. Whatever the trouble, he's with you. So, think about who you select as 
close people to you, associates, maybe roommates, if you're about to go off to college or have already. Well, we've learned that a wise person pursues wisdom rather than wealth, and that gives him discernment when selecting a friend. Remember this one, Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, but whoever associates with fools will suffer harm. It's kind of related to the one we just saw. Wise people choose people who are going to work with you, who are going to be your companions in something, be a roommate. Make sure they're trustworthy. Make sure they're trustworthy. Well, that ends the chapter and our lesson. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word and this great, uh, these many great points of wisdom that we can benefit from to learn from you and then turn around and apply in this world. Challenge us with the things we've heard today. In Jesus' name, amen.